This is the design of Amsterdam's new erotic center. Commissioned by the city government in 2020, it's a concept for a 5,000 square meter high rise with hotel rooms, offices, bars, entertainment facilities, a store, and a restaurant. When it's finished, it will be one of Europe's largest and most advanced brothels. And as interesting as its design are the locations that it's being considered for, locations on the outskirts of the city. So why did Amsterdam's government commission the design of this new building? Why at locations far from its historic red-lit center? And why are people so angry? Back in 2009, a labor politician waited. The city was voting on a plan he had spearheaded, a plan called Project 1012. Named after the zip code of the city's most notorious red light district, it was designed to clean it up. Low quality buildings, such as window brothels and coffee shops had to go. But instead of making new regulations, the lawmaker was praised for a unique approach. His solution was spatial, buy up buildings associated with crime and push crime away. The city government was convinced and his plan would pass. Little did they all know it would soon collapse. Over the course of more than a decade, it would lead to the closure of more than 100 individual window brothels, along with tens of individual coffee shops. However, when attempts were made to measure the impact of Project 1012, not much could be found. It had a marginal impact on crime, and today the center's image as an adult theme park with shady edges still remains strong. But if there's one thing his plan did do, was that it created a rift among hundreds of sex workers in the city government of Amsterdam, one that persists even as the newest mayor picks up the mantle again and tries to change the center even more. In 2020, the city government banned organized tours of the red light district. In May of 2023, bans on cannabis within the district entirely. There's also been mandated bar closures, bans on the sale and display of alcohol, and even ad campaigns targeted towards young to middle-aged British men. She and the executive body have even floated the idea of banning international tourists from buying marijuana in the city entirely. She's also brought up the idea of introducing entrance gates to the red light district. This would create the first physically regulated neighborhood in a major European city. Not even Venice does that. But her most controversial suggestions started soon after her nomination in 2019, when she brought attention towards changing the rooms in the red light district again. In Amsterdam, there are actually three separate red light districts. The most well-known is in the center, called the Valle, which has 249 rooms. But the other two, and much less well-known, are the Singelgebiet and the Röstelkade, which have 63 and 40 rooms, respectively. In 2019, Femke Halsema, the newest mayor of Amsterdam, presented four scenarios for the future of the Valle. Three of those scenarios targeted each of these districts in order to reduce over-tourism. Her first scenario was to change window prostitution permanently. Amsterdam closes all the curtains in the Valle and Single, while the rooms stay open. If a lot of the attraction to the red light district is simply to be able to walk around and look, take away what people look at, and you not only reduce potential tourists, but push the tourists that do come to other parts of the city. With increased digitization, Sex workers can increasingly rely on getting clients via their phones rather than off the streets. The assumption is that this would just speed up an inevitable transformation from physical windows to digital ones. In her second scenario, Amsterdam would see the most radical change. All the rooms in the Valle and Single are removed and shifted to other parts of the city. The number of rooms does not change like it did in Project 1012, but their locations do. However, because closing all the rooms in the Valle is highly unrealistic, the city government is going forward with Halsema's third and most realistic scenario. Instead of all, a chunk of the rooms in the Valle and Single are moved. Although it's more realistic, the city government has not made it clear how large that chunk will actually be. But, different from Project 1012, Halsema has made the commitment that when rooms get removed, they have to come someplace new. 
At the start, the government considered two building types, a single unit high rise, and the second, a cluster of different multifunction buildings. They also commissioned research into building on a floating pavilion. The design is meant to anticipate for about 100 individual rooms for sex workers and also other entertainment facilities. On the one hand, the city wants to model Pasha when it comes to size. Pasha is the world's largest brothel. However, it's not a particularly welcoming or friendly looking building. So on the other hand, they also want to model the more modern, less sketchy design of Antwerp's largest brothel, Villa Tinto. But these brothels aside, there's a few things that make Amsterdam's new erotic center completely different. The mayor of Amsterdam knows that a brothel is controversial. This is why she hopes Amsterdam can make one with class and distinction. By mixing hotel rooms with painting courses, art exhibitions, and a debate center, the hope is that they can avoid designing an isolated sex palace. For an actual physical model, they commissioned Moog, a Dutch architecture studio, to come up with a design. The architects Gianni Sito and Jurgen ten Hoeve designed a concept that attempts to convert the linear streets of the red light district into a circular form. Inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim, Sito won an architecture prize for making a design that repurposed two sugar silos into a cultural center with internal circular walkways. Jurgen ten Hoeve, the other architect, was nominated for the same prize in 2018 for his design of a collection of buildings modeled after a monastery. It was a network of buildings superimposed in Rotterdam that attempts to give an option for pedestrians to leave the busyness of the city. Together, both architects produce an interesting combination. You get a building that kind of looks like a parking garage with a continuous walkway that allows you to walk in the building as you would in the Valle, but circularly as opposed to linearly. Also, instead of a floor of the same individual homogeneous hotel rooms, it also attempts to recreate the network of the buildings on the street on each individual floor as well. To choose a location for the building, the city government considered eight regions, and as of today, they've narrowed it down to two main locations, NDSM in Noord and around the Rai in Zuid. In Noord, Amsterdam would have to deviate somewhat from the original Moog design and construct a floating brothel. It's likely that it would be a ponton of around 100 by 20 meters, with 2,000 square meters of space for five total floors. One basement, one roof terrace, and with the remainder holding the rooms and other facilities. The government also considered repurposing a cruise ship, since it would already be readily equipped with rooms, bars, theaters, and attractions like casinos. However, a cruise ship has a large number of constraints, making it an unlikely option. NDSM is a preferred location comes from the fact that it's a diverse, culturally rich neighborhood. It has plenty of room for additional buildings, such as for any needed security or additional parking, but it also hosts one of the largest flea markets in Europe, has multiple popular restaurants and cultural attractions, and it also has a high density of mixed residential use areas. Nonetheless, NDSM has a weakness. Its most immediate connection is via ferry. Not only is that slower than other forms of public transport, but a ferry can only withstand so many more people. Amsterdam has considered building bridges to north, but it's unclear how long that would take or if they'll ever be built at all. So NDSM's main fault is its reachability, but NDSM's biggest benefit is that it's considerably hipper than the other section of the city that's under consideration. Zuid is the poshest and most entitled area of Amsterdam and offers two plots, the Groene Zoom, a 2,000 square meter triangular piece of land, and then a second, likely the preferred option, a 21,500 square meter plot of land owned by the city government directly. Unlike the singular ferry connection in Noort, Zuid has access to two metro connections. One that goes from north to south, giving potential clients from the center immediate access, and it also has a metro going from east to west, granting direct access to Amsterdam's business district. What it loses in being a hip and chill place to be, it gains in accessibility. It also has ample parking space. However, what both North and Zuid still have in common is that there are NIMBYs. Homeowners have voiced concerns about noise, criminality, and impact on children in the area. Some sex workers have also voiced concerns about their own safety. According to the city government, the building will likely be a safer option than the status quo. 
Instead of sparse, separated buildings in an overcrowded neighborhood, a single building would have a centralized security system with a clear oversight over who enters and who leaves. The erotic center does what Project 1012 couldn't. It gets rid of rooms in the center, but without pushing sex workers into an unregulated underground. Also, unlike the Volle, which mixes tourists with potential clients, the new building is meant to attract primarily the clients. Some sex workers have complained that over-tourism has reduced their incomes because large crowds make actual potential clients too self-conscious to consume. According to the city government, a well-connected but more isolated building would reduce the attraction of the red light district for tourists, attract more clients than in the center, increasing sex workers' incomes, but it would also be quieter. Tourists are loud, but clients are the type of people who want to be private and have as little attention drawn to them as possible. However, this is also where some more difficult problems emerge. The Vola, with all of its issues, still has a unique advantage. It has a lot of eyes on the street. In the same way that it may make some clients too self-conscious to consume, it may do the same for more serious criminals. And this is where you get the NIMBYs. Homeowners would like a building that's as invisible as possible. This is why the mayor has also promised a closed, isolated building that brings very little attention. However, the more isolated and quiet the area, the more concerns about sex workers' safety. Also, the city already has problems with the number of police and security. Since the Vala isn't entirely removed, by building an erotic center, you end up producing a fourth red light district, which potentially spreads an already thin police force even thinner. So the mayor has had problems. She's faced considerable backlash at town halls, and she's had to postpone making decisions on the erotic center. However, since 2021, Halsma has had a majority in the government. People can postpone and argue all they want, but all three parties, GroenLinks, D66, and PvdA, have agreed, be it an isolated building, cruise ship floating pavilion, north or in south. Some rooms in the Valle must be removed, and instead, they must come somewhere new. However, a new erotic center may not even be Amsterdam's most controversial plan. The city government has also proposed replacing its historic famous public urinals with an advanced AI-powered urinal that comes out of the ground. The story is fascinating, and I've made an entirely different video on it that you can watch right now on Nebula, a creator-owned streaming service where I'm posting the genius design of Dutch public urinals early, as well as my future videos. Once you're there, you can also check out my video on Corbusier's plan for gigantic highway skyscraper, and you can watch other exclusive videos made by channels like Neo, Mustard, City Beautiful, and countless others. Nebula is great, and I really cannot stress that enough. It not only gives me the freedom to spend excessive amounts of time in a basement making videos for strangers on the internet, but it also provides great videos that you can watch nowhere else, and also classes, so that you too can also learn how to make videos in your basement, like I do, on Dutch Public Urinals. If you sign up using the link below, you can support me directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for a 40% off annual plan, which is as little as $2.50 a month.